Because, so the, to kind of summarize, uh, just for people who are listening who aren't familiar uh, with, with what's going on, I know there's a lot of people in Australia who don't really understand what's going on. I know that it's a story that gets no coverage in, in the UK or for the rest of the world. Um, you know, for the last seven years, uh, refugees from you know, all over the world have been, who have been uh, hoping to seek asylum, you know, f- ultimately fleeing for their lives have been sent to Manus Island, which is just off Papua New Guinea. Um, I, ha, roughly how many people have been detained there, would you say? Yeah, um, that in, in the beginning, in 2013, um, to approximately 1,400 were sent to Manus. And another, um, I think it was about another 1,500, possibly more, to Nauru. And over the years, some have been going to America because about three years ago, I think there was a deal with Obama. Oh, no, no, four years ago, a deal with Obama and Kevin, uh, what's his name, Turnbull. <laughs> I get his name wrong. <laughs> Turnbull. And Malcolm, that's it, Malcolm. Uh, there was a deal to take 1,250 refugees. And of course, when Trump came in, that sort of slowed right down. And Trump's like, we don't want your, you know, whatever. So, um when I went there the first time, there was 600 there. The second time, there was about 400. Now, there's about, and there's under 200 in PNG, um, Papua New Guinea, because they're not on Manus now, they're in Port Moresby. And there's about just under 200 on Nauru. Um, there's a couple of hundred were many facts here last year, and they're all being kept in hotels and detention centres in Australia um, locked in, locked in on one floor and guarded 24-7. And they're, they're literally losing their minds because they don't know what is going to happen. There's no plan. So they go each day for the last 12 months now not knowing how long this is going to go on for and if they're ever going to get released. Is it illegal that the Australian government are holding these people in detention centres for as long as they're doing without processing them, without any kind of plan to to get them back? Well, actually, yes. However, um, so what they've done is they've basically started this this, um, story, I suppose, this false truth, because they've been saying it for so many years now, it's become almost a truth, but it's not, of course that um, it's illegal. So there used to be, um, uh, uh, what are they called? Maritime arrivals, un, uh, unidentified, I can't remember the name now, but there were maritime arrivals, uh, unusual maritime arrivals, something like that anyway. And what happened was about, um, I think it was when Tony Abbott came in, he then started to instruct his staff to call them illegals. And it wasn't illegal, of course, because if somebody does something illegal, and this is, how, this is where they've conned the Australian public. Because if you do something illegal in Australia, you go to court, you get, you get charged, you go to court, you get a sentence or not, and then you go to prison or not. But all these guys that are called illegal, um, have arrived illegally, they've just been put straight into prison, into um, extremely uh, pr- prison conditions, and actually worse, because it's indefinite. And, but the trouble is, because they um, c- continued that, that, that lie for so long, people actually believe that the illegal story, and they also use things like the terrorists, uh, then Peter Dutton started saying, oh, we're stopping the boats, and then it was like, we're protecting our borders, and, you know, depending on, you know, what suited the uh, political climate at the time. So, yeah, it is actually illegal. And what happened in PNG in 2016 was uh, the PNG High Court ruled that what Australia was doing was illegal. And Australia settled out of court $70 million to give to the refugees. Wow. Yeah. Was that 70 or 17? Sorry. 70, 70. And that was to give to the refugees. Yeah. So all the refugees that put their claim into the High Court case not all of them did of, of, uh, because some of them said no way you're not going to buy us they were you know they've all they're all individuals you know um so uh, but then they all got different amounts depending on their situation and how long and or, you know there was all different reasons you know 
But um, yeah, seventy million dollars. Essentially, paying them to keep quiet. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And whatever it, whatever they got, it's never going to um, pay for the you know seven years of their lives have been. Exactly. Yeah. And so, what in terms of like. Um, organizations like amnesty and groups like the un um what kind of action are they taking on this and what kind of stance do they have is it a big focus for them yeah yeah so UN have been going there i think it was like when i was there the un were there so they've been going there on a regular basis for years possibly twice a year and then at one point there was like every few months and so they would go and talk to the guys they made um recommendation that they, they they i think in the beginning they they, they they said that it's not um what's happening is is inhumane they've told the australian government that many times they've written reports insisted it should end amnesty have done the same um doctors for refugees um all of the refugee organizations uh, the um, ICC is it there's all these different organizations have told the government this is not on it's not okay it's inhumane what you're doing is not you know not within the uh, UN convention you know so but um, yeah each uh, Scott Morrison uh, he's like I don't care we, we, we choose what you know we choose the rules and it's it's so strange that you know the the government can break these uh laws and break these agreements that they have in place and as much as you know the un and amnesty are putting that pressure on them that they're still able to get away with it and there's no kind of consequence or further action that we can do like it just seems that at the moment we all all we can do is just shout and shout until hopefully um you know uh, scott morrison listens and does a u-turn on it all but it's it, so when you have figures like pauline hansen and um you know one nation who have put constantly pushing this false narrative there then you know the public are going to buy into that um how so what what is what, what's kind of your kind of uh, framework in, in moving things forward um yeah i'm not sure at the moment because um yeah everything's been tried and so i think it's um i don't know what's going to happen the uh, home affairs abf um because these guys are, are so sick now i mean i have regular conversations with them every day and they are they, they brought they were brought here with medivac because they were sick and most of them aren't getting any treatment and um you know it, and nothing seems to work so really to be honest with you all of the all of the um refugee groups and all the um people that are working on this uh, having regular meetings what can we do next there's campaign after campaign um but and, and and you know and trying to find ways to appeal to the public because it's how do we how do we find a way to get the public informed about this you know, we tried the money that's being spent, you know, like um, $350,000 for each refugee for each year that's being detained in Australia. An offshore of $650,000. Um, $16 billion has been spent so far in the seven years. But it, that doesn't seem to work because um, I think, see the trouble is, this is not just about refugees, this is about our, our nation. Uh, it's, it's, across, it's across the whole political spectrum of, I suppose, across the world. But in, our, in this country, um, there are many of our rights are being eroded right under our noses. And um, I think what's happened is people are quite disillusioned. People have lost um respect for the government and so i think people just bail out of politics and they kind of almost go well i there's nothing i can do about it i'm just going to live the best i can in my situation until of course they're affected mm. and then that's not going to happen for a while for many people uh, people with disabilities have been very um you know they've, they've, they've compromised um people in aged care you know older people have been very compromised um and it, and of course refugees incredibly compromised 
uh, in Australia as well, the ones actually live in, the, in you know, their, their visas are very substandard, so they're not getting support at all if they don't, if they lose their jobs. And so um, it's starting to get, and now we've got this Black Lives Matter movement, which is just showing, I mean, the Aboriginal situation is disgusting and it's been going on forever. And they've been calling out for such a long time. So it's, there's many areas that really do need a huge shift in how we just do life, you know? There's like, there's something, it's, it's all breaking it. And the, the, gov, the, the ruling government are actually not following the laws themselves. They're breaking the laws and they're manipulating them to suit their agenda. And it's all about them, their status, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, I think we're in unprecedented times at the moment, really, to be honest. Yeah, I've always thought, like, I've been thinking that a lot recently, it's kind of before, even before, like, coronavirus, and now with uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter process, there was, you know, there was um, the environmentalism, all, all, we just seem to be at a point in history where, you know, it's kind of like on a knife edge, which way we're going to turn we either make this conscious change for the better to improve everything or we go the other way and I certainly think that you know it's kind of like a kettle that's been slowly boiling and now it's getting to that point where it's uh you know it's it's telling you to make a cup of tea <laughs> but it's uh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really strange and one of the great like one of the, one of the good things from all these protests is it's creating that discussion again um you know with it's it's getting people to talk about education and talk about history and it's it, the only way we can really move forward is by acknowledging the past and acknowledging that you know there are many people still suffering today as a result of the past and even presently like a lot of the refugees are coming from places that are war-torn and a lot of the reason these countries are war-torn is because of the west involvement particularly when you look at the uk and america their their involvement with things like the war and terror that's created like the middle east is is so unstable now because of it and that's why people are having to to, to flee and then we're turning them away so it's uh yeah, it's a very strange time we're in and it's uh but as you say you know these it's it's uh it, it's all about trying to change that public uh, perspective yeah, yeah, and and I think that um, look, I, I, I get excited about the protest because I think it's brilliant because people are actually going, they're saying no, and that's that's really good, and um, so so that does give me hope as well. That really does give me hope, and I um, yeah, I think there is there is a, a, ch a chance for change, and there's most days I feel very excited about the prospects of what could be, you know, where we could be going. And then every now and again, like the last few days, I just go, oh my God, it's over, it's doomed. Yeah. <laughs> send it now for me, please send it now. Yeah. But then of course, you know, but the, I spend every day scheming, what can I do next? You know, what can I do next? What's my next um, work that I can do to raise awareness? And uh, I guess I'll just keep doing what I've been doing for the last, I don't know, three, four years on this. And um, yeah, just keep, writing the music and playing the songs, telling the stories and hope that it will be a part of the big puzzle that needs to be completed. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think, yeah, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. If, if we, if we see, you know, these issues as a puzzle and then each of us individually is a piece. And I, I don't think, I think when, when we look at leaders responses to these uh, protests and to what people are asking, like their ignorance so it just kind of affirms that they're not going to make any change so you know individually you know if we're all one piece of the puzzle then that one piece on its own isn't you know can only do so much but it's when all those pieces come together and we all start taking action and raising this awareness that that puzzle's completed um so i think it is just about looking at what we as individuals can do to change whether it's people's perspective or change ourselves and then if the more and more people do that then we start to put pressure on the people in power who can actually make the facilitate these bigger changes yeah yeah and, and, and big picture wise i think that um 
there's a situation we've got actually right now is that, that, that the people that are in power, it's kind of weighted towards um, a certain um, personality, um, tend, tend to be male over a certain age. So I think that, um, and of course I see lots of memes and funny things on Facebook about um, the stale, pale, white male or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and of course, and what I find is a lot of the younger guys like myself <laughs> is that you've got a whole different way of seeing it. So I think that we're possibly, I don't know, maybe there's a generational, there's a generational thing as well. And maybe, um, I don't know, sometimes I wonder, because I think we went backwards, because I'm, I'm obviously very much a women's right, you know, advocator as well. And I noticed that we were really doing well with women's rights. And, um, but it kind of went, I think it, it stopped and started going backwards again. And I have lots of chats with my friends and we all say the same thing. And I don't know, on a big picture scale, and I look at the whole world. Uh, well, actually, no, let's, I'm just talking about the Western world, actually, because I have got no idea what's going on in, in other continents. But I am familiar with the Western world, um, Australia, Europe, um, the UK and, and, and America, I suppose, to a certain extent, um, I think there's a shift happening. I think there's a lot more women who are educated and in positions that are um, not, nowhere near enough, of course, but enough to create a bit of a fear for the, for the men that have held those positions for a long time. You know, we know there's a very small elite group of people that hold the, you know, 90% of the power or whatever it is you know and when I say power the money basically because it's, mm. you know, it's all about money and um, there's also more people from all different walks of life and all different nationalities um, gaining um, you know more, more status within their careers so I don't know I just think that there's possibly a little bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a tremor you know before the earthquake and so there's a bit of a grab for um, holding on to that power. And uh, there's a bit of fear kicking in. And um, yeah, yeah, I think that, that it could be a bit of the, the, falling, the falling of the patriarchy or the fear of, but actually, actually, if only, uh, and I do look, I meet lots of, because um, obviously I've got to be very careful about how I talk about this. <laughs> I meet lots of people, like, you know, I, I meet lots of uh, guys who are, in, in that age that are incredibly um, just just totally thinking in, in, in terms of um, wanting things to be more fair all across the board and they don't want that role in life you know because it's a burden like you know and so the more that people that the, the, the more that the guys that are thinking that way that they're free as well so if 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 women and people of color are all getting that equal treatment in life that equal place in society that has been held for those that have only ever had the, you know, that elite position, everyone's relieved, relieved of, the, all those guys, they're relieved of the burden of carrying all that, you know, they can have freedom as well, you know, like, but for them, but obviously there's a bit of a fear going on. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, just push a bit harder. Yeah, I think it's that kind of idea, because it's, it's funny that it's, that the conversations come to this because I've just been, I've just filmed a, a short video early and been talking about like nationalism and that sense of tradition. And I think it links into a lot what what you're talking about the the idea of the the patriarchy and the, the structure of it is very much built on um, you know that tradition of capitalism how how it's built you know this idea that the the Western world the way it operates is the best way you know the only way and any attempt at changing that risks kind of unbalancing those scales and it's kind of <clears throat> you know it's that idea of you know that change some people don't want change because they benefit from the way things are other people don't want change because they're uncertain about what that change can bring and I think if if you you know there's if you want change and you know how to get it and you can persuade those people who are on the fence about it then all of a sudden you outnumber the guy who doesn't want to change and then you know ultimately it's, it's going to happen it's inevitable the weight stacked in your favor um but it's i think it's just that old-fashioned mindset especially especially in australian politics um yeah. there's no there's not many people you look to as inspiring they're all kind of acts in such a spoiled brat way they, they don't listen they shoot people down the behavior is rude like it's it's worse like you see the way they speak to people 
who disagree with them and it's you know it's child it's like play school kind of stuff it's uh and these are people who are elected leaders of the country and they they behave like spoiled kids um yeah i think maybe this is the point where you know it's 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 the the dark you know it's it's darkest just before the dawn kind of thing and it's yeah um, yeah <laughs> to, to, to quote batman uh, but it's it's, <laughs> it's uh yeah. it, it does seem that way like we're, we're in that tunnel we're in that darkness and it's uh eventually we, we've got to get out and uh, i can't really see what else could really happen there's all um but if not then at least we've got some really good memes from it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I've got a lot of hope for the young people as well. I've got a huge amount of hope because um, they're doing amazing things. I mean, with regards to the refugees, there's a there's a, a, um, a camp down at the Kangaroo Point Hotel right now. So that's been going on for a week. A whole group of young people created this um, event last week, and they've been protesting at the Kangaroo Point Hotel every day. And so they're all very, very, um, they keep their knowledge base going. So they know what their rights are. Uh, so they know uh, with regards to COVID, they're following all the strict COVID-19 regulations and they know exactly what they're right. So when the police come and tell them, uh, you know, you're going to move on, they know, no, we, uh, they know straight away, uh, what are you moving me on for? And what have I done? What's the law? So they totally know. And then they've got like, they had a, a hundreds of people there just last Saturday. It started to get a little bit out of hand. So they've got de-escalators within their group. The de-escalators go around with their fluoros, high vis on, and de-escalate, you know, just to calm <laughs> down. Came and then they've got around the back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they've got police liaison officers because it's about peaceful protest. They've got people emphasizing this is about a peaceful protest. This is about not about us, this is about the refugees. And so they're really like so much more advanced than I was when I was that age. <laughs> and so that gives me a lot of hope, actually. And they're mustering up a huge amount of interest. And they've got, they've got all the media there, like, which, you know, a lot of us have been advocating for years. And I think they're having more of an impact in the last uh, couple of months than we've had for a long time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit excited about that as well. That's brilliant. Um, so in regards to the kind of work you've done, um, you, you filmed a documentary, uh, Music from Manus, uh, Five Days, Not Five Years. Like, what, what was your story in terms of, get, like, how did you get involved in that? Yeah, so I um, I just started, my friend started posting on Facebook about these refugees on Manus Island and it was, uh, what she was posting was quite damning towards the government and I kind of thought, this was about four years ago, and I thought, oh, I heard about these refugees being put offshore um, back in 2013-14, but I really didn't know much about it and to be honest with you, I switched my TV off for about 10 years, I, I didn't use it, so, and I'm, I just, I was totally engaged in music, you know, my whole life was music. And so I really didn't, and, I, and I'd, I'd lost um, faith and hope in the government. And I was basically doing just what I said earlier on that I thought everyone else was doing. So, <laughs> you know, and so I kind of, so I, I she's a very, I, I've got a huge amount of respect for, she's an artist, Ruth Halbert, ruthhalbert.com. And she, um, I knew that she doesn't just say things for the sake of saying it. And so I was checking out some of the stuff she was sharing. And then she started writing a letter to the Prime Minister every day um, for two years. And that kind of was getting my attention that she was doing this letter every day for the ref each, ref each letter was for a refugee on Manus on Nauru to Malcolm Turnbull back then. And then she, and, and then I, uh, one of the refugees, what happened was I liked one of her posts and it was a YouTube video. There's a guy on Manus, uh, Mustafa, his name's Moz. Moz from Manus, he's a musician. He um, wrote a song. Um, they, him and his friend got the video done because uh, they had mobile phones over there then because the law changed where they could have mobile phones and people all across Australia sub support these guys to make sure that they can have mobile phones. That's why we've got you know, this information. And um, they wrote this, so, so they, he then, uh, so there was a video. So what happened was a lady in Melbourne, Dr. Emma O'Brien, she put together this, um, a bunch of amazing musicians, created a track with this song, Moz singing. He put the vocals on via phone, <laughs> mobile phone. 
and it's called We're All the Same. It's an incredible piece of uh, music. And so I just happened to see a video of that on Facebook where in Melbourne they had a huge protest and they played it over the loudspeaker. And I liked it. And then uh, straight away Moz friended me on Facebook and he messaged me. And I had no contact with any refugees on Manus at all. And I had no idea who was there, what countries they were from, anything like, you know. I'd heard about these illegals and that they were terrorists. That's all I knew. So I was a little bit, you know, gee, I hope this is okay for me talking to this um, person. He was from the Middle East. I had no idea which country. That's how you and get then... on blacklists. <laughs> 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 and then I, um... yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how scary it was. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it was incredible. He was this young man. Um, he was 29, I think, back then. Um, Mars, Kurdish Iranian, the most beautifully spoken, gentle, and he was in a terrible state. Um, he was having uh, he was having stammer, heart palpitations. He was in a, having panic attacks because it was the point where all of the refugees were at this camp called Lombron, which was out of town, and they were locked in. And the government had decided after they um, ruled that it was inhumane, the government decided to open the gates and then move them to new camps being built in the town. And the locals in Manus didn't like the refugees and didn't want them there. And so they were, actually um, attacking the refugees. Um, it's quite dangerous in PNG. Um, if you go there, you know, you, it, you basically got to guard your life because it's um, kind of a, a bit of a lawless state, a uh, huge amount of poverty. It's, Port Moresby is probably one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Um, so it's not a place for um, 1,200 refugees to be roaming around on this island that you know belongs to the, the you know the local people and so th what happened was the British, the Australian government ABF ordered that the camp be destroyed and the refugees were going to be forcibly moved to um, the new camps and they refused they refused to go they, they protest peacefully for 24 days so for 24 days they had no food no water and they had to, locals brought it in for them, sneaked it in, the local churches sneaked it in. Wow. Um, it was incredible, it was incredible. And so I was just horrified by all of this. I mean, I was, Mars was spending me little, he was sent in like these little 20 second video clips of what was happening, you know, four wheel drives smashing down the water tanks. And it was just horrendous, like, you know, the whole place was trashed. And if anybody, if they want to watch the, the, the um, obviously the, uh, the documentary is on YouTube now, and so I became friends with a few more, like Farhad, another, another musician, a few more, a few more. And so it just grew from there. And then I felt like I had to do something. I thought I got to do something. And I had no background in refugees, no background in uh, casework or anything. And I just thought, I'll, I'll go and play music. Like, I'll just, you know, that's what I'll do. And, and at that time, I was doing protests in my town with Ruth and uh, just a peaceful process in the middle of town and we started to get a bit of backlash from the community members and i decided if i could take a filmmaker with me um, and pro just produce something to bring back to my community and then i can show them the truth you know what's going on and so i asked a, a local guy who's a filmmaker to come with me and so that was it off we went yeah wow and it I imagine it was it must have been a huge eye opener once you get there and you see you know you know these hundreds of people living well who are forced into living in these prisons where the conditions aren't great they're not they're not are they, they're not getting access to to healthcare like any doctors or anything is that is that the case yeah the ones at that time there was a little clinic at the camp which was only open office hours then there was the local Manus Hospital, which was for the locals, but it's just this rundown um, facility that's got nothing there. Like, so even the locals, you know, there's just people everywhere. It's dirty, it's smelly. It's like, it's not really, you know, a, a place that you can, you know, you trust that you're going to get your health seen to. A lot of them come away sicker, you know? So um, yeah, the medical treatment, the, the, look, the government will tell you that they were getting the medical treatment. The government will say that there was one doctor 
per eight refugees or whatever it is. However, when I went there, I saw it. There was one doctor per 600 refugees and um, there was nothing else. So, and it was only office hours. Yeah, no, they weren't getting, no. Nah. They were getting some. They were getting lots of painkillers, lots of sleeping tablets, lots of antidepressants. Um, and there was a hospital in Port Walsby that they would go to if they got really sick, but that, they had to get really sick for that. 13, 12, 12 um, men died offshore. And um, some of those were because their medical condition got so bad, it actually, they died. One guy got an infection in his leg and he uh, was just a young man. Um, the Australian government would not allow a medivac. The doctors kept requesting it and they wouldn't allow it. And on the tarmac, in the hot sun, on the, on the, on the you know, the hospital, the, the, you know, the, the bed on wheels, he died. Wow. And that, that's just one, but um, yeah, yeah. And you, you mentioned earlier about the, uh, the effects this is, have, this is having on their, uh, mental, their mental health. Uh, suicide, I, I, I think I remember reading um, a while ago that suicide has been a big issue there as well. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, self-harming and su suicide attempts. And um, in the last 12 months before the Medivac bill, there were multiple suicide attempts on a regular basis. Um, look, I'll just give you an example. When, when the Medivac bill came in, um, I was doing lots of updates for the guys. So lots of the guys um, that I was doing the updates for, they were sick, and I was sending an update to the doctors. So the doctors had a web page set up, and then anybody of us across Australia as advocates, we could just write out, Muhammad is sick today, he has thrown up, he, you know, just the, the, the things that happened that day. And a lot of the ones that I was sending through was, um, you know, Hussein, I'll just, I'm just making up names now, has just cut himself across his arms. Um, uh, as, and, um, and asked another guy, he uh, called me in the middle of the night and he sent me photos because his friend tried to hang himself. He sent the photos of the security guards cutting him down. Um, it was just overdoses. Another guy that I was with took an overdose. He almost died. Um, it was just horrendous. That, that was just a horrendous time. Um, on a, yeah, it was like every day something different was happening. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, and what, what was the... Uh, what could you, could you just explain a bit about what the Medivac bill is? Yeah, the Medivac bill was when uh, some crossbenchers um, and some Greens members decided, um, Kieran Phelps was the instigator of it, that we cannot leave these guys any longer. They are so sick. They were just so sick, all of them. Every single one had medical conditions, kidney stones, heart conditions, uh, incontinence, stomach pyloralia which is like this uh, bacteria that you get and they were becoming resistant to the antibiotics um, they had bones broken from these riots that happened in 2014 that were never fixed and um, lumps and just it was just this skin conditions ear nose and throat problems they were all and, and all and many of them were really uh, mentally not well so this bill got passed it was unprecedented it was amazing uh, in February of the 14th of last year, and it was the moment that I landed on Manus with a lady that I went with that it actually passed. And so um, what it meant was that two, uh, the, the, a refugee, if they were sick, they could be assessed by two doctors via Skype, you know, via video call, and through their medical records that were at the PIH hospital in Port Moresby, and if the doctors um, could, uh, authorized it, if the doctors said that they needed to be brought to Australia, but the, the treatment could not be done in Port Moresby, then they would be brought to Australia. Peter Dutton then had the say in it. He had the ultimate say. Um, if he wanted to say no, he could. However, because it was two um, doctors, um, there, it, you know, there was a couple of hundred that came here. And then what happens in, as soon as the government won power, in November of last year, they repealed it. Wow. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like they're just, they, uh, so the government that's in place now, it's just, they just want to cast the refugees aside and just kind of 
ignore them and forget about that kind of if you ignore the problem it, it doesn't exist that sounds like yeah. to me that sounds like what they're what they hope like that's kind of their game plan on of, of it all it's just like leave it for someone else it's not their problem yeah yeah and 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 the it was it was it put in place by labor back in 2013 this this policy to send people offshore the pacific solution and then when liberal came into power labor say that it was just a temporary thing and it was to stop the, it was to stop the trafficking you know the smuggling you know and then of course when liberal got in they used it as a borders thing and look i don't have much regard for both parties because they've all participated you know in this um but liberals have then um not refused to back down and scott morrison was immigration minister um back then and now it's peter dutton and scott morrison obviously is the prime minister so we've got these two men who are adamant they just will not back down it's like they have got a, a bee in their bonnet a chip on their shoulder whatever it is um i actually believe it's pure racism um and uh, and and it's politics it's um it's, it's they're political prisoners they've used this so what they've done is peter dutton especially they've They've basically said to Australia, we're going to keep you safe. We'll keep you safe. We'll stop these terrorists coming in. You know, it, it was about saving lives at one point. But then, of course, when you keep people in detention for years and years, it, it's no longer a, a very good story to carry. So then it was like, we're protecting your borders. We're stopping the, the terrorists from coming in. We're going to keep you safe, Australia. You know, we'll look after you. Don't you? So that, that, when, it, when a government of any country puts fear into the people and makes tries to create a dependency on them to keep them safe. They've got a huge amount of power, huge amount of power. And they continue that because that won them the votes. <clears throat> so what they've created really, when you think about it, and look, it's not just Australia, it's happening in America, um, UK to a certain extent, but um, they've become like these dictatorships where they actually have control of the people by using fear. Exactly, yeah, and it's I, something that, you highlighted as well like i know this kind of uh comparison gets gets made a lot in a lot of aspects but uh, if you look at hitler and uh, germany they you know they they brought up that fear of uh, of jewish people or minorities uh, and then ultimately the, the the final solution which is what they called it was put you know once they built that fear to a certain point they were able to justify look we're putting these people in these camps for your safety um and from from what they've called it the pacific solution it's you know it, it's almost the comparisons there right in itself they built up this fear of asylum seekers saying they're terrorists you know they, they're trying to get in we're protecting the borders we're keeping you safe so we've come up with the pacific solution and we're going to keep them on these camps you know in these detention centers it's exactly the same treatment uh, that hitler and nazi germany had towards uh, jewish and other minority groups as well it's uh it's really weird how like for like because I, I know that that comparison with you know fascism and hitler gets tend to be used a, on a lot of aspects but i think in in here it is literally a, a mirror image of of how of how that came about and uh, hitler used it to rise to power just as uh like the Australian government have done as well. You you play off that fear and it gets you the votes. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah. Sorry, Richard. Yeah, yeah. No, you're exactly right. And it was, uh, and I think that when the Liberal got into power, because people will say, "Oh, yeah," but the people voted for them. I actually think that yeah, a lot of people did vote for them. However, I think also the lies and the deceit and the money that was put in from different, like Clive Palmer, the sports rorts. I think it was a real big scam and um, they got in unlawfully. That's what I believe. Yeah, and, it, and it's just, was it, there's so much, there's just kind of so much at, at stake in these elections as well. It's like, it, there's, there's a, it's no wonder so many people get disenfranchised with, uh, 
and just kind of disillusioned with politics because it's like there's so much deception going on there's so much lies um the media is funneling you with x you know this information and then you look on facebook and they're funneling with you with other information it's it's not hard to see why so many people switch off and disengage with politics because they just they're tired of it and they don't know what to believe but unfortunately you know it, it requires our participation it requires our action because as we see in around the world if you know when you leave governments to to their own devices it's it's always to benefit the few at the expense of everyone else um so we do need to be aware of it and we do need to educate people on the importance of of uh, politics and why we need to take that active role in it yeah i think you're right and, and i think what's happened here is is that um, the situation we are in now is that we it, it is at a very dire in a very dire way um, things have gone downhill pretty badly but it's been very slow so the frog was put into the water and it was boiled up slowly like you know and um, and I, when I do all my music talks um, what I do is I talk really strongly about how we it's now time that we all have to participate the, the, the freedoms that we have, are not something that just comes just naturally, it's something we have to fight for. And right now we're at a time in history where we have to fight much harder. The trouble is you see, is that because of um, the industrial revolution, because of the whole, the way the economy is now, um, it's all about growing economy. It's um, everybody, because everybody's, everybody thinks that they've got this level of freedom because they can earn money and all those things. And the trouble is, really, the situation we are in right now is, is very much like, I think, um, the dictatorships that we've seen in history, but it's just dressed differently. So we're not actually being controlled with covert, you know, or, or um, out there brainwashing, but, the, but there is a huge level of that going on. There, there's no doubt about it. We're all being seduced. And so we can't say no to that that little, you know, extra bit of whatever it is they're trying to give us, you know? So, and we're, and we're allowing ourselves to be totally seduced into this, this, this situation we're in now. And the trouble with that is, is that we have, the only way out of that is that we've actually got to um, see it. And that means we've got to eat a bit of humble pie, you know? And it's like, it's like you had a big fight with your partner, you realized you're the one that made the mistake and you're gonna sit there and say, look, I'm really sorry, but I stuffed up, you know? So it's like us saying to ourselves, you know, I've stuffed up, I've been seduced into this for all these years. I actually thought that I was getting equality. I actually thought that I was getting a fair go. And I actually thought that this was about all people. But really what we've done is we have allowed money to take over and we don't, we no longer put people first or human rights first we allow the government and politicians to play games with people's lives to keep power because we have allowed ourselves to be bought by the money that that we think we're getting you know so and this is another thing i keep saying at all my talks this is not a political issue this is human rights at what point in time did we decide that human lives were less important than the political games that people were playing because it's only countries that are really that we talk down about that would do this type of thing you know <laughs> we're yeah. doing it ourselves yeah. this country our government we're doing it and it's, it's always painted off as collateral, collateral or a necessary evil when our own country's acting that way it's um it's it's always masked and it's it is such a facade that you know we're the first to cast the finger at others yet we completely ignore or refuse to acknowledge the wrongs that that we're doing ourselves and i think as as a as a person living in australia or in the uk or in america you know we have this kind of that illusion of you know that freedom or that illusion of comfort and when you have in the case of here the refugees who are looking to you know essentially just fleeing for their lives and the media paint them as terrorists or the media paint them in a way that's going to threaten that comfort or threaten our way of life or threaten that ultimately threaten that illusion 
um, is, you know, people become afraid, they become scared of change. They don't want them to impose. They don't want them to change that way of life, even though at the end of the day, they're not doing, you have much of these, the people who are against refugees, calling them terrorists, don't realize that they have so much more in common with them than they do people like Scott Morrison or Donald Trump or Boris Johnson. And I think it's, you know, if you can, if we can prove that you can change one person's mind on this, then you can change everyone's mind on it. And it's just a waiting game, really. It's just how, it's just how much time it's going to take. But unfortunately, in this situation with these refugees, time isn't really something that, you know, it's already been, what, seven, seven years, did you say they've been there? Yeah, seven years. Yeah, yeah, seven years. Mm. And um, they, their lives have been destroyed. Like some of those guys were, there was a, there's a few guys that were 15 years old and they came as minors. So um, they're only 22 years old. They've been imprisoned by the Australian government for seven years. Wow. Um, yeah, they, they've had all their youth taken. So they haven't been able to see their family. Um, some of them haven't even told their family what's happened to them. They've just said that they're in um, Australia or, you know, because they can't bear to tell the truth that they've been, um, put in prison because the family are going why why are you in prison they're going you must have done something wrong I'm like no we didn't we didn't you must have done why and then it's two years later three years later why are you still there they won't because they won't let us go but why won't they let you go you you know what's going on and it's um it's horrendous i can't imagine it it would be heartbreaking for the parents as as well like there's a uh there's a clip <clears throat> excuse me sorry there was a uh there's a scene in your documentary. Um, I think I think you was talking. I think it was from Somalia, and they was talking about the situation that led them there and how they um, they they was kidnapped uh, in Somalia, yeah. and then they was essentially forced into to fight in in this in this civil war, and they didn't want to be a part of it. Um, and in these countries, if you say no, you're dead. So they've fled that country. They put their life on the line to flee. And then, you know, they're, they're looking for that better life. And, the, you know, that's the thing that's keeping them going. And then to hit this roadblock where it's like, you know, you think you found safety, you think you found, um, you know, that comfort, that normality again. And then the Australian government who, who should be, you know, by international law and by these international agreements, they should be taking them on board. They should be looking after them and giving them that that shelter and said they've casted them aside locked them up in a detention center which is essentially a prison and that's seven years of your life gone it's uh yeah you really can't really and put it, it's it's and, and in the in on manners that, that, that the, the detention it's more than detention it, it, it's, it's worse than prison because what the policy was that that um the staff all the staff that were employed there so they had wilson security uh, they've had different security companies there they were briefed that they were not allowed to have any connection with the refugees. They were not allowed to have any physical um, closeness in any way. Like what I've been mean is that even the caseworkers were not allowed to give support to these young men, you know, um, a caseworker, she called me when I came back, she told me her story of how this 16 year old boy, he'd been um, beaten down to the ground because the guards were beating them as well. He was wow. crying. He was in his own urine and she just put her hands on him and said, it's okay, mate, you're going to be fine. They called her into the office and they sacked her because they were briefed in the beginning that you were going to make, uh, the policy was to make it as difficult, as, dis, as, as bad as they can to, so that the, 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 the idea was to, for the refugees to want to go, it was so bad that they would want to go back to their homeland. So wow. that was the, that was part of the policy. So they employed people who would follow those rules. And when I spoke to the refugees um, on my first visit, they said all of the good people, you know, the caseworkers or guards, never lasted very long um, because they just couldn't cope with um, the situation. It was just too traumatic, and and they might have got a little bit close, and so they then would get sacked. And anybody that tried to do anything that was helping the refugees anyway um, lost their jobs. They just they just wouldn't get the contract. Same thing happened to Nick. Um, oh, I can't remember his surname now, but he's a doctor on Nauru. He there's a documentary with him 
um, he kept on um, speaking up over and over again because these people, he's a doctor, he says, I can't allow these, um, this sick person to not get treatment. And in the end, he just didn't get his contract renewed. And that is something that happened over and over. And, and when they first arrived on Manus, I, I, and there was lots of punitive arbitrary things, you know, like I remember Moz saying to me, he said, you stand in a queue, they stand in queues for hours for their food in the stinking hot sun because it's a tropical island. It's the most disgusting place you've ever been to as far as um, oppressive heat. He said, you stand there in the queue for your glass of milk and the guard would pour it in and he'd go, oh, just over half, oh, too much, throw it away, pour it again, just under half. And there were all these arbitrary things. They, they would take away board games or when the guys tried to put like, because there was like 50 of them in this sort of air court, aircraft hangar, all these bunk beds all squashed up. And they tried to put a sheet around their bunk just so that they could have a bit of privacy and it would all get ripped down by the guards. And they'd search through their stuff twice a day or whatever. You know, it was just this awful, um, and that's just a few of the things that they went through. It's, it's dehumanizing isn't it i think the way that the the guards and the, the workers have been told to to behave towards the refugees you know they, they're treating them it is like animals it's treating them like prisoners and that's it helps build that narrative what what they're doing yeah. the only the only way that we can keep quiet and keep the country quiet about this is if we present these people as criminals as animals and dehumanize them as much as possible they're terrorists you know they come in here it's going to you know it's in the safety of australia to keep them as far away and it's uh yeah there's so much that it's just baffling how the media can continue to to keep silent on it um which is a whole discussion in itself but ultimately you know this should be a global issue it should be a global outrage but the fact is that only you know it's not even national knowledge in australia not everyone knows about it which is why yeah. you you have to do the, the work that you're doing to raise that awareness but the, the reality is that this is is well the only word that i can really fully describe it is criminal yeah, and, and of course a lot of the media couldn't go there, so uh, we weren't allowed to go there. I didn't get a visa, neither did the filmmaker on both visits, when I went the second time as well. We just rolled up at um, Port Moresby Airport and just had to hope that we'd get in. And we had to say that we had been invited there, so we had to have the name of a local person. And we said that we, you know, I, I think my guitar saved me the whole time. Uh, when they asked us, what are you doing here? Because he had a bag full of camera equipment. Uh, I said, oh, we're just, we're, we're, we're going to be uh, filming on location a song. And I heard about Milner Bay. So I told him, oh, Milner Bay is, uh, we, we, we're interested. Oh, he said, that's, that's my favorite place. You know, this is the guy who had stumped our <laughs> passport. <right. laughs> we were very lucky. And, and so we got in, but uh, and many people didn't get in. And on, our, on my second visit, I got deported after two weeks for talking to refugees um wow. yeah and is the punishment in because i i can't remember the specifics but i know like i'm sure i've read about um like the refugees who have speaking out who have managed to get these things out there like there's how they've been treated they they've been punished as a result of that yeah yeah so um Abdul Adam Aziz is an amazing man. Now he won the Martin Ennial Human Rights Award, not last year, but the year before now, in Switzerland, Geneva. And he won that award for his courage and bravery standing up for human rights against the Australian government on Manus Island. So on Manus Island, he spoke up, he was a great advocate, he spoke to media and everything. And yes, he was punished, and but eventually uh, all of his work paid off. He's the guy that's in the documentary. Um, he, um, yeah, he won. He won. He won a human rights award. Wow! Because, uh, I, I, but it was the Australian government that he won the human rights award against. Imagine. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. Like, it's like. <laughs> 
they're inhumane, you know, like it's just, it's crazy, like, you know, it's just incredible, like, I mean, could um, you ever imagine? Yeah, it speaks volumes, the fact that you've, you've won this award against you, like, this, this government is so bad that it's, yeah, yeah. everyone's won an award for fighting human rights against it. Um, what yeah, kind of, yeah. So what kind of punishment did he receive as a, as a result of, of coming forward? Well, he never got interviewed for the U.S. And um, he and he was uh, when they were protesting, he was thrown into prison. Um, he believes that the reason why he never got processed for the U.S. was because of um, his advocacy, what he was doing. The same happened to Beirut. Uh, Beirut Bachani is this incredible man, award-winning journalist and writer. Yeah. Uh, he wrote the book, the No Friend But the Mountains, and it's won awards all across the world, multiple awards, and the same happened to him. He never got interviewed for the US until right at the end, uh, when the government were desperate to try and, you know, get this situation, you know, finished. And he also got targeted on a number of times, um, you know, and, and they also had a, um, a um, they called it Chalker, it was a, like a sea container and it was for, um, uh, they were put there on their own um, for a, a couple of days in, in a scorching hot temperatures. Wow. So uh, isolated, yeah, yeah. Uh, anybody that spoke out or disagreed with something, they were thrown in this, um, yeah, sea container. That's, uh, that's mental. And it's, it's just it's the kind of behavior that you just don't expect to be happening from your own government. And it's these kind of actions, like it is stuff you see in Holocaust movies or in uh, yeah. you know, American slavery movies that just that treatment and that behavior towards them. It's just, yeah. So what's, what do you think we can all do then? Because obviously it's, it's not, it's, it's not front page news in Australia the way it should be. And it's certainly not, front page news on a global scale which it, it should be up there as well so you know it's it one thing that I, I wanted this to kind of this uh, chat with you to address is why it it's not just an Australian issue it's you know it is a global issue uh, you know if we especially in the light of these protests if we're prepared to say you know we're standing up for other people's human rights then we should be making sure that we're doing that for every person not just what what you know, not just one minority, not just one group, but every group who is kind of experiencing any thought, any form of, you know, abuse, violence, discrimination, anything. So, you know, what, what do you think, what, what can we start doing to, to change this and to get these people the help that they need? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think it is a global issue because um, I know that other countries are starting to follow the model of Australia because they think that what you know, Australia's doing is a, is a solution. So I think that basically we need to speak out more about it. So it's a bit scary in Australia because it sort of puts you, you then become, um, it's, it then becomes very clear where you stand. And what's happened with politics across the, uh, the Western, you know, nations is that it's become divisive. So people are fearful to talk about where they are positioned. And I think that what we need to do is, and this is what I do all the time, is to change the way that we do all of that stuff. It's not, there are things that are about politics and there are things that are about plain human rights. And so, and we need to think about the people, like not the, what can I get out of it? I kind of look at us, right? We're in the top 5% on the planet. If you've got a roof over your head, if you've got clean water, if you're safe and you've got food, you're in the top 5%. Our job, I really believe that our job is to then be of some service to those who haven't got what we've got because the reason why we've got what we've got is because they are suffering because we've taken, we've taken and taken for so long now and in the, when I say taken, I mean that we've put money into arms and, and, and bombed countries because we wanted a little bit of that ownership of that or whatever it was. And uh, we've dressed it in, um, we've dressed it in some rubbish about, you know, keeping these people safe, but at the same time we're bombing them or whatever. And so I think that what everyone can do, right, this is what I think everyone can do, because this is like from a, on a, on a, 
a core level of who we are, we need to live more in truth of who we really are and what we really represent on the planet, okay? Because no one should ever underestimate the power of what they can do just by living what they believe that they need to be living instead of continuing this facade that we think we should be doing. I think COVID has been incredibly helpful because we've stepped back a bit and gone, gee, actually, that's a, that crazy. That's a rat race, you know? Um, that's like, what, what was I thinking like? You know, we're starting to see exactly this ridiculous consumerism type economy thing that we've engaged in. We, and we've started to realize that actually life is about people and, and our connections. And it's about the things that, that are in nature and, and all those, you know, those things that bring us together, like, you know? And so I think that we need to live our truth. We need to share that with others. We need to be bold. We're going to take we're going to courage and step out and say, look, this is what I stand for. This is what I represent. And then we then inspire others. I've watched so many people. I'm in, I've been inspired by so many people when they just have a little bit of courage to step outside of their comfort zone. And that's something I've been saying a lot of my music talks. We have come to a time in history where we now have to take the courage it's not about the courage to fight the lions it's the courage to step out and speak things or write things or sing things or whatever art we can use to position to, to show where we stand because when you do that you are then opening a door to for other people to go they're going to be oh my god that's they're, they're thinking the same as me that's so you know and on a practical level, level, we can write to our local members of parliament, keep writing to them, keep saying what you don't, what you don't approve of, basically. And don't allow yourself to be, we've got to fight, we've got to stand up. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Uh, as you say, it's, it's, it's not necessarily about fighting the lions, but it's, we should definitely kind of stop feeding them. We should stop allowing, yeah. you know, these people to, to continue to get away with it because that's the only reason these people at the top are benefiting it is because we let them do, uh, whether it's out of naivety, when it, or ignorance or comfort or fear, we let them do it. And it's why we turn a blind eye to things like uh, child trafficking in the middle of, uh, in Asia and, um, you know, child labor camps and manual labor camps, because, you know, w we benefit from, we benefit from smartphones and the technology that that produces. So it's, uh, it's kind of that fear of coming out and speaking against it. Someone's going to go, well, you're a hypocrite. You've got an iPhone. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's not about, how you know you can you can have the iphone it doesn't make you a hypocrite for speaking out just don't queue up on day one for the next one go well i've got this iphone until you know i'm going to campaign against apple until enough people get them to change it and if they don't change it then when they do release the next iphone i'm not going to buy it and it, it's the same kind of principles to take across into action with uh, with the government and what they're doing on Ranu. So it, they, they continue to get away with it because we play into it. And as soon as we s stop and as soon as we say, look, you know, when this is, this needs addressing, then if enough people do it, then they've got to really listen. How do you go about, because one thing that, you know, I noticed when I was in Australia and you notice it here as well. And just in general is the people who are kind of comfortable with speaking out who are you know racist or hateful towards these people you know how do you go about changing their minds or changing their opinions and getting them to look at you know the, the truth of it yeah look it depends which ones okay there's some that you, there's just they're just they're just like real life trolls like you know they just go round and round in the same loop that they believe in and those people i think are a very minority and i basically don't even bother going there i just i just you know this guy came up i was standing in the street in denmark with my sign there was a bunch of us this old guy comes across he came marching across the road he was like a big angry face and he had his finger points and he says I've been to all those countries in Africa. I've been all across. Have you been to Africa? Have you been all across the top of Egypt and all around, you know, the, the, around the East Coast and the, you know? And I was like, no. And he went, well, I've been there. And do you know what? Those refugees, they all, they all kill each other. They all kill each other. That's uh, what they do. And I was like, 
really? Okay, is that so? And I, we just all looked at him because we were like, and then I just made a decision on this particular occasion because I could see who he was and where he was coming from. And I went, right, okay, thank you very much for that very interesting piece of information. And he just went, and he just marched off really angry because we didn't respond. Mm. So, and like in the documentary, um, I spoke to Aziz about that because Aziz got lots of abuse. He says, ignoring is worse than responding because when you respond to them, you give them a little bit of a stage. So ignoring is worse. And I just went, yeah, that's right. So what I do is I, I assess each situation I come across. I listen to people, what they have to say. I give them a, a, I give them a space to, to speak. And I focus on, this is not about me, right? So every person I come across, and if there's a little bit of anger there or something, because you can feel it, I, I go on what I feel. And sometimes people are saying something, but I'm feeling something different. So I, I go on that, I go, okay, this person's saying all the right things, but it doesn't feel nice. So I'm gonna go with that. And I'm gonna just sit and listen or stand and listen. And then I, just make a decision at the time about what, what I'm going to do with it. So I never ever take it personally. Whatever they're saying, I quickly tell myself, this is them talking about themselves. So if they're going off about, you know, you're doing this, yeah, I'm going, okay, this is what they're saying about themselves. So if they are angry, that means they're coming from fear or deep sadness. And so I take that into account as well. And so basically I just listen to them and I will just sort of, um, I might ask them a question like, you know, like they start going on about bloody this and I say, okay, okay, what's your, um, do you, you know, what's your uh, knowledge on that? Or do you know, or yeah. And, and I just, yeah, I just try and um, not take it personally. I don't try and argue back with them. It's very rare that I lose it because I know that's that's what they're going for so what i'm trying to say is when somebody is angry and they come forward with you to, towards you they are they want to fight and what they want to do is is they want to bring you into their vortex of anger so then they don't have to face the issue that you represent now if i draw myself if i allow myself to get drawn into that then they can then fight back at me and go, there you go, I knew she was a something whatever bitch and she's just this and that there. So they can have a go at me. If I stand there and hold my own and refuse to respond to that aggression or whatever it is that person's doing, he or she, um, they then have to face themselves. They're left with it. I like that. <clears throat> So what you what you're saying essentially is you know it is about it's it's picking your battles, uh, we and it's something we see all the time on social media. There are there's there's people who they're not interested in the debate, they're not interested in the discussion, they're just interested in the reaction. And by them them being angry is a projection of you know, it's them being angry about the topic isn't the topic that's making them angry it's them who are angry and by yeah. rising a response out of ourselves if they if they can make us respond in anger then they've won because they can turn this the topic they can turn the discussion away from the topic and make it about our violence our anger um which i think is what the media are doing at the moment with the protests as well because you know <clears throat> like with any protest there's going to be a, a small minority who are violent and they're not necessarily there for the protest they're there because it's a, an excuse to be violent and then all of a sudden the media take that attention away from the issues of the protest and what they're highlighting and make it about the damage that is being caused and the statues that are being graffitied or turned down and then the disc the anger is directed at that and it's brushed away from what the actual discussion is yeah 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 exactly yeah well so yeah i like because one of the things yeah. i've been and also what happens is is that we are then distracted yeah i think what happens then also is then we are then distracted from what our what what, what our purpose is so whenever i've got into anything in the past where i'm um suddenly like bloody how dare he 
you know, and I like, yeah. and then I go home and I have a glass of wine and I'm like, that, you know, and I, and I chat to my friend, you would not believe it, I cannot believe it. So that then, and that could go on for a day, that could go on for a few days. Everyone's got the different dramas in their life in the extended period of time. But what that is doing in essence is that's taken us off the path that we want to be on over here. And my focus always is to be on that, that path to the, the light. Because if we can maintain a positive and an expanding view of everything, so if we can focus on being all that we can be, our purpose on earth is not just to be a, a, a little uh, sort of um, unpurposeful human, you know, just doing little, taking up a little bit of space and not doing too much. Our purpose is to be all that we can be, to express all that we are, and to share that with others so other people can be all they can be and that is expanding the universe is an expanding entity and so we are also meant to be expanding this is just what i believe okay and then when we do that if we can focus on going towards the light and staying on that track and keep going okay what's my next thing what's my next thing and try and push that away and hopefully if you know the more of us that do that then you know no that's that's a really good point so for anyone who is listening just to kind of wrap everything up nicely um the the documentary is going to be linked in the video description so i definitely re recommend people watching that it's uh it's about 30 40 minutes and it just really highlights uh you know that some of the stories and the conditions that uh, people are experiencing there so once you've watched that and you know you want to take that direct action now to to, to support these refugees and to put pressure on the australian government to to um to address these issues how can they then go about in this moment taking that next step that direct action yeah okay yeah look um contact me if you want to contact me uh, wherever you are in australia i can put you onto the nearest group of people that are taking that action yeah so you can find me on facebook dawn barrington uh dawn barrington music um yeah yeah just you know just just message me because i can then wherever you are i can put you in contact with um the groups that are nearest to you there's lots of refugee groups all across Australia, lots of people um, that I'm connected with all, all over. So, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, well, Don, thank you very much for your time. Um, there'll be all links for Don's profiles uh, and for the, uh, for the documentary below. Um, so thank you very much for coming on and talking about your experience and talking about these issues as well. I think it, it, it's covered some really good ground. And I think uh, once people listen to this, like it, it should hopefully, if not open their eyes, but put them on that path to start looking into it a bit more and hopefully just question the, uh, question the narrative that's, that's, that's around it at the moment. Yeah, thanks so much, Richard. And I really appreciate you doing this. And you do a really good job of it as well. I love it. I, oh, love, how you. You, I love how you work. It's a natural. It's a natural. I love it. Oh, it's, yeah, um, it's, yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, it was a strange thing because it was, it was just kind of like a couple of weeks ago, or probably a month ago, I was just like, oh, I've been wanting to do this for a while. But I've always been kind of held off about doing it because it's really out of my comfort zone. Because like, when we're playing music, I barely do any talking between the songs. I'm just like so <laughs> self-conscious and self-aware. <laughs> so I'll kind of mumble what the song is or what it's about. But it's <laughs> like, um, yeah, something like this. I, I just, I thought, right, if I do it, I've got to commit to it. So the night, the night that I came, like had the idea of doing it, I was like, right, I'm just going to message some people straight away. And then I went to bed and then woke up and a couple of people replied saying they'd get involved. I was like, oh no, now I've actually got to do it. Uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been one of those, it's been a strange kind of thing. It's still in its very early days, um, but it's, I'm hoping to talk to, you know, about these issues and people, because there's so many issues going on that everyone's experiencing. I think the great thing now with social media and the internet is, you know, yeah. it's not, it's not, impossible for for me now in the uk to speak to you in australia and get these issues and put them essentially to the you know potentially all across the world are able to, to look in on it so.